Across Europe, there's a second wave of coronavirus. Or is there? A number of people are saying that the figures are mostly not real due to problems with the way that tests are run. What are the arguments? What's the supporting evidence? Let's have a look. My name is Malin Baker. This is the Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Over recent weeks, we've been seeing graphs like this. Very clear evidence at a glance that we are rushing headlong into a second coronavirus wave. And these are the graphs that are being shown by public health experts to justify new lockdown measures. So it matters because we know there are real costs to lockdowns measured in terms of lives lost as well as lives ruined. There are lots of ongoing debates and arguments about what those curves are telling us and what this means for public policy. And that's the way it should be. These are important areas. They should be vigorously debated. I'll continue to cover those debates and the evidence in future videos, as I have in past ones. But here I wanted to focus on one specific challenge we've heard in recent weeks, which is to the integrity of the tests themselves. The concerns that people raise are twofold. One is that the tests generate around 1% of false positives. And although that doesn't sound a lot, it turns out to distort the results considerably. And two, that the tests are too sensitive and are returning results that identify lots of people as infectious who simply aren't, even though they may have had the virus in the past. One of those is to do with how the statistics are interpreted. The other is about how the tests are actually conducted. So what are the tests and how do they work? We're talking about the RT-PCR test. The acronym stands for Reverse Transcription Polymerase Chain Reaction. But you knew that already. It's a pretty sophisticated technique which copies a chain of DNA into billions of new copies. The point of it is to locate a distinct piece of genetic material that might be present in tiny, unmeasurable amounts and to make it measurable. It's used to detect what are called RNA viruses. These include influenza viruses, rhinoviruses, coronaviruses, Ebola viruses and many others. You may be used to the idea that DNA is a double-stranded molecule that encodes huge quantities of information used by the organism of which they're a part. RNA, as in RNA virus, is very similar but they are single-stranded. There are certain other differences as well, but those aren't important here. The RT-PCR test begins by making that RNA into DNA, which it does using a specific enzyme. That's the reverse transcription part. Once its information is encoded as DNA, it can be replicated in sufficient quantities to register on the test, which is a huge exponential multiplication process, resulting in billions of copies. The discovery of the process earned Kari Mullis his Nobel Prize. The test is able to target segments of RNA that are distinctive to the virus that you're looking to detect. Any coronavirus, for instance, may have lots of sequences that are in common with each other. What you want to look for and amplify is a sequence that is unique to the individual virus that you're trying to detect. How does a test like that create a false positive? Most typically if a sample gets contaminated in the lab or if there's been a lack of proper pre-release testing, you could potentially get false positives if a selection of the parts of the virus genome that you're targeting actually ended up matching another virus as well. So tests need to be validated to check for such problems, and any high-quality lab is going to be very aware of that in the tests that they use. Poorly validated testing is not thought to be an issue in the current COVID-19 tests in any of the informed discussion that I have seen. The other possible effect is if they were sick previously, but now they're healthy. There are traces of a virus still in their body, but they're not replicating and they're not therefore infectious. Technically, that wouldn't be a false positive because it's correctly detecting the virus RNA in the system but it's not telling you information that would be helpfully actionable, i.e. whether or not that person's infectious or is about to become so, and therefore should be isolated from other people. Now, generally, the performance of a PCR test is considered to be really good 
you get a very low rate of false positives, maybe around 1%, maybe significantly less, which means that at least 99% are accurate. And we'd all agree that sounds pretty good, right? However, and this is the first objection, although it sounds good, if you push the test to scale, testing hundreds of thousands of people, and you're testing for something that's not very prevalent in the population, say only 0.05%, which is around what COVID-19 was estimated to be in the population on the week commencing the 25th of August, then the basic maths of the situation means you have more false positives than you have real ones. To illustrate the point, suppose I carry out 2,000 tests. With 0.05% of the population infected, that will give me just one individual out of 2,000 who has the virus. However, my test has a 1% false positive rate. 1% of 2,000 people is 20. So I get 21 positive test results, only one of which is real, and the other 20 of which are false positives. Now clearly on those figures, that's not gonna be giving you a realistic picture of what's actually happening in the community. And the more you test, the more cases you will find, regardless of whether they actually exist or not, the phenomenon that some people call a case-demic. And some argue it's even more problematic than that that the test may be so oversensitive that many of the cases it's picking up that are not counted as false positives are nevertheless people who have had the virus in the past, are not now currently infectious or infected. And this comes down to the fact that the test is one that uses multiple cycles. As I said, you're taking the identified genetic material and then you're reproducing it exponentially. One cycle doubles, the next cycle doubles the result and so on and so on until you have enough that it can be detected and that takes billions of copies. The fewer cycles it takes before you can detect the virus, the more of the virus there was present in the sample. So the heavier the viral load and the more likely the person is contagious. The more cycles you do, the more you'll detect virus fragments that were really so low that they weren't active or contagious, either because they were just fragments or because the virus load is so low. Many coronavirus tests are reported to having fairly high cycle thresholds, with most set at 40, some set at 37. Juliet Morrison, a virologist at the University of California, Riverside, said that her view is that any cycle threshold over 35 is too sensitive. She said a better threshold would be 30 to 35. Michael Mina, an epidemiologist at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, goes further, arguing that the threshold should be 30 or less. So this is the core of a sceptic case. Even with a low percentage of false positives, when there's very little virus in the population, the noise of false positives drowns out the real positives. And in any case, the sensitivity of the test means that even some of the true positives are not necessarily infectious people who should be isolated. And this case got some real traction recently, when the UK government's health secretary, Matt Hancock, demonstrated on live radio that he didn't personally understand the maths behind this, believing that a 1% false positive rate meant that 1% of the positive results would turn out to be false, not 1% of all of the tests carried out, which is actually the case. Which is obviously a pretty big conceptual misunderstanding on the part of one of the key people making decisions on behalf of the country. So, what's the case for the defence against those criticisms? How strong a defence is it? Well, let's take a look. First of all, the basic maths of the objection is entirely correct, but it applies to tests carried out at random to the wider population. The people that are mostly getting the tests at the moment are people who are showing some of the symptoms of the disease. So the prevalence of the virus in the testing sample is going to be a lot higher than that of the wider population. To some extent, we can quantify that. So taking the recent testing results as reported by the UK's Office of National Statistics. On the 22nd of September, it was reported that 188,865 people were tested and 4,926 people were found to be positive, which is around 2.6%, a lot higher than the 0.1% considered to be in the population. 
Looking again at the figures on the 29th of September, it was reported that 245,363 people were tested and 5,693 were found to be positive, which is around 2.3%. One minor note, which is that when you get those two figures, the number of people tested and the number of people found to be positive, it's easy to assume that one figure comes from the other, but the tests take a couple of days to get results, so actually the numbers found positive are not from that day's testing, I assume, but from one or two days previous. So those percentages, 2.6% and 2.3% are illustrative, not exact. Minor differences between the two don't necessarily constitute a trend. And that matters because on the 22nd, the number of tests carried out were a bit lower than the preceding days. So whereas you might look at those figures and think the percentage of cases has gone down, that's not necessarily the case. Either way, the argument is that even if a false positive rate is as high as 1%, there's still roughly a 2 to 1 true to false result ratio. Tom Whipple, the science editor for The Times, argues that it shouldn't be as high as that in any case. He pointed out that on the, July the 12th, before the second wave kicked in, there were 360 cases from 209,000 tests. Even if all of those were false positives, that would still only be a false positive rate of 0.17%, not 1%. And since the false positive rate should remain broadly the same, any increase or decrease in the percentage of positive results should genuinely reflect the detection of cases. Which may still not mean that none of those cases fall foul of the second objection the oversensitive test detecting old virus fragments. However, if a percentage of cases is going up, then that is arguably going to be connected with new spread of the virus. If there was no new spread, then the numbers would stay the same at worst for both of those sources of error. And they've not been. Now, that's a fair argument, so long as one thing is true, which is that the number of tests being carried out has stayed broadly the same or is declining. If more tests are carried out over a period of time, then you would inevitably see more cases being recorded. As we could see from this recent graph, the number of tests has been going up. So that on its own is likely to be contributing to at least some of the upward curve. But there are good reasons to accept that even though these factors may make the headline figures less than they seem, they don't actually explain all of the increase. For instance, if the virus is genuinely spreading in the community, you would expect it to leap ahead in some locations, not simply to increase evenly across the whole population, because that's how these things spread. And that's what we see. Higher infection rates in the northwest, Yorkshire and Humber, London and the northeast, where there are big population densities. Unless you'd increased local testing disproportionately, the only way to explain those increases is genuinely increased spread of the virus. Also, the more important factor with something that has the potential for exponential growth is the speed that it's growing, more than the definite number of absolute cases. If the presence of false positives meant that the real number of cases turned out to be only half what the headlines report, it would only delay the growth of cases by about a week. We're also seeing more people reporting COVID symptoms as reported by the COVID symptom study. And we are now starting to see a growth in hospitalizations. Those remain extremely low, nowhere near the levels in April. Skeptics have a strong case to argue that the virus targets the vulnerable and so the low percentage of serious cases should be influential on your policy response. That's a perfectly solid debate to have, as long as you're having it with a clear eye to what the data is telling you. Because it's another indicator that however fuzzy the testing results are, there is definitely some uptick in cases that do genuinely count. But the results could be less fuzzy. A paper published in Nature on the 12th of May pointed out that a simple way to massively improve the accuracy of the tests is simply to test people two or three times. And particularly if people were tested first with a rapid testing kit, they would be less accurate but would give results very quickly. And then people who test positive in those tests were then tested again with the PCR test. This approach would reduce the false positives significantly.
And that's because for simple maths, that says two tests with a small percentage of false positives, the chance for any one person both tests show a false positive is massively less than just one of them. But this highlights the challenges with all this testing process. It's not that the tests are flawed, which they are, but they can be improved. Really, it comes down to what the tests don't measure and what the authorities in most countries appear to be relatively incurious about. The vast majority of deaths in the first wave came from people with comorbidities, people who were exceptionally vulnerable. Presumably, the reason why the hospitalisation rate is so far below where it was is because many of those people sadly died in the first wave. So to predict what really counts, the number of people who end up in ICU beds seriously ill, we really need to be measuring something more granular than just the number of cases. However good the test, they're not predictors of serious health outcomes, unless we can factor in an estimate of the truly vulnerable population and their likely exposure to the virus. We see what's going on with the virus imperfectly, as though we were looking at the world through glasses that have been smeared with Vaseline. The things we could see more clearly, the exact demographics of people that are experiencing the worst health effects, that information is not being routinely reported. And there's no reason why it shouldn't be. The models that predict outcomes, the scary graphs with the exponential curves, don't factor those people in. They talk about spread over an extended period of time with no distinction between cases that kill and cases that get shrugged off by young and healthy people. It's all based on worst case scenarios and headlines, which would be fine if there were no negatives to overreacting. And because in the UK public policy changes almost weekly, we have precious little data about what's actually working in containing the spread of the virus. We just lurch from one new thing to the next. When the figures go down, as eventually they will, regardless of what we do, we will no doubt claim it all happened because of our policy. And until then, what happens will be in spite of our policy which is one of those convenient systems that means you can never be wrong. It's why the doctors of old used to swear by draining blood from seriously ill patients, which we now know did them more harm than good, but could always be justified as having been right regardless of whether the patient died or not. We thought we'd move to an era of evidence-based medicine, but that's not a phrase that naturally comes to mind when reviewing the evidence of the year 2020. So the conclusion to this, the testing we have could be better, reduce the cycles to make it less sensitive, introduce a system of double testing to reduce false positives and indeed false negatives. But the real problem is the disconnect between the incidence of cases and the expected real world health impact of those cases. Because we seem to have leaders who don't even understand the basic maths of how this works, in spite of those expert panels that are supposed to be advising them, it seems unlikely that any of them are demanding the better data and the analysis that we would need to manage this situation better. We're into the so-called second wave and we still don't know whether we actually have a real problem or not. The figures are unreliable, not because the tests are bad, although they can be improved, but because they are presented completely out of context. We need to be asking better questions. 